What is going on? Welcome, fellow adventurers, to a journey through the realms of Middle Earth. Today, our quest takes us to a moment in the tale of our beloved hobbits. As they approach the borders of the Shire, an eerie presence envelops them, one that penetrates their very beings. It is within the ancient depths of the Old Forest that our story unfolds today. Remember everyone, if you find this video helpful, informative or entertaining today, please remember to hit that subscribe button below. By subscribing, you'll never miss out on any of our latest videos and you'll be supporting us to continue creating great content like this. The Hobbit's journey beyond the tranquil confines of the Shire has been fraught with fear and terror. The encounter with the Nazgul, the chilling dance with the malevolent trees, these trials have left their mark. And it is on this night a night when Frodo experiences his first visionary dream, that the veil between the waking world and the realm of phantasms is lifted. Today we shall bear witness to the most crucial moments of communication. Mortal men and hobbits peer through the ethereal veil, gazing into the dark halls where Sauron reigns. Frodo's encounter with the enigmatic figures of Tom Bombadil and Goldberry becomes a sanctuary for his weary spirit. The eldest and the river daughter, they offer solace, healing the wounds inflicted by the recent perils that they faced. Within the haven of Tom Bombadil's home, Frodo's soul finds respite. Like a spiritual day spa, this detour allows our hobbits to hear wondrous tales and partake in the joy and laughter of the mysterious couple and it is in the presence of the fair Lady Goldberry that Frodo's spirit is revitalised, invoking a similar enchantment as Sam would later experience with Galadriel. But it is the first of Frodo's prophetic dreams that beckons us. From the pages of chapter 5 in book 1, a glimpse into the future unfolds, revealing secrets yet to be unveiled. Eventually he fell into a vague dream in which he seemed to be looking out of a high window over a dark sea of tangled trees. Down below among the roots there was the sound of creatures crawling and snuffling. He felt sure they would smell him out sooner or later. Then he heard a noise in the distance. At first he thought it was a great wind coming over the leaves of the forest. Then he knew that it was not leaves, but the sound of the sea far off. A sound he had never heard in waking life though it had often troubled his dreams. Suddenly he found he was out in the open. There were no trees after all. He was on a dark heath, and there was a strange salt smell in the air. Looking up, he saw before him a tall white tower, standing alone on a high ridge. A great desire came over him to climb the tower and see the sea. He started to struggle up the ridge towards the tower, but suddenly a light came in the sky and there was a noise of thunder. In this pivotal moment, Frodo finds himself haunted by the return of his fears, the dreaded black riders who relentlessly pursue them. However, amidst this unease, a profound image emerges, capturing his attention. The white tower and a tantalizing glimpse into distant events. It is within the house of Tom Bombadil that the significance of this vision comes to the front. They collectively perceive it as a glimpse into Frodo's future, a glimpse into how his perilous journey may ultimately reach its conclusion. Before we continue to dive into visions, foresight and what it all could mean, I wanted to take this moment to talk about our sponsor for today, G2A.com. G2A.com is the world's largest marketplace for all sorts of digital products. Whether you're looking for games, software, or gift cards, they've got you covered. With millions of customers who have already saved using G2A, it's a platform worth checking out. From now until June 19th, G2A is running a special promotion. When you buy one item, you get another at 15% off. 
That's right, this must be the feeling that Pippin had when he realised that it comes in pints. To take advantage of this offer, simply click the link in the description below, it will take you directly to the website where you can explore all of the best deals available. Personally, I am so tempted to go back through the war in the north, it's a game I could just replay and replay, and finding a PC copy is so hard these days, but G2A have just made it easy, and with our promotion too, it's the perfect time to make a purchase. So if you're looking to add some new games or software to your collection, I highly recommend checking out G2A.com. Open the gate to adventure and click the link in my description to enter the digital world. To gain such foresight, as Tolkien himself wrote, one must receive it from a figure who possesses knowledge of the future. Within our narrative, the number of characters who can claim such knowledge is remarkably scarce. We are left with two possible sources. Eru himself, the supreme being, or one of the Valar, the powerful divine beings within the legendarium. Notably, Ulmo, often associated with water and particularly with the hobbits, emerges as a potential and maybe most likely candidate of these. Frodo unwittingly becoming a recipient of such celestial insight is guided by forces beyond a hobbit's comprehension. In an essay called Osanwe Kenta, written by Tolkien, he writes that no mind can possess knowledge of what is not within it. Everything a mind knows is derived from its own experiences, although in the cases of beings in physical form, certain memories may be temporarily inaccessible. However, the future is not contained within the mind, as a mind existing within the bounds of time cannot perceive or have perceived it. To gain knowledge of the future, a mind must rely on another mind that has seen it. This can only be Eru, the supreme being, or a mind that has received the insight into Eru's purpose, such as the Valar, who were once the Ainur. For an incarnate being, understanding the future is possible through instruction from the Valar or through a direct revelation from Eru Iluvatar himself. In essence, it highlights the limitations of mortal minds in comprehending the future and emphasises the need for divine intervention or guidance to gain insight into the yet-to-be-unfolded events. So then, what of the tall white tower that is mentioned? There is a light glowing within, and the Black Riders have gathered around it. Amidst their snuffling presence, fleeting visions of Frodo's ultimate quest come to the forefront. It is widely speculated that the towering structure depicted in this vision is Elostirian, situated upon the tower hills to the west of the Shire, being one of the tallest of the White Towers built by Gil-galad for Elendil. In due course, we discover that one of the Palantiri, the mystical seeing stones, is positioned here too, overlooking the vast expanse of the sea, maybe giving that hint into it being something that Sauron himself can see as well. Of the two significant dreams experienced by Frodo during his recovery at Tom Bombadil's house, one dream reveals a clearer narrative. It seemingly portrays Gandalf and his entrapment within the walls of Orthanc. In the dead of night, Frodo lay in a dream without light. Then he saw the young moon rising. Under its thin light there loomed before him a black wall of rock, pierced by a dark arch like a great gate. It seemed to Frodo that he was lifted up, and passing over he saw that the rock wall was a circle of hills, and that within it was a plain, and in the midst of the plain stood a pinnacle of stone, like a vast tower but not made by hands. On its top stood the figure of a man, the moon as it rose seemed to hang for a moment above his head, and glistened in the white hair as the wind stirred it. Up from the dark plain below came the crying of fell voices, and the howling of many wolves. Suddenly a shadow, like the shape of great wings, passed across the moon. The figure lifted his arms, and a light flashed from the staff that he wielded. A mighty eagle swept down and bore him away. The voices wailed, and the wolves yammered. There was a noise like a strong wind blowing, and on it was borne the sound of hooves galloping, galloping, galloping from the east. Black riders, thought Frodo as he wakened, with the sound of the hooves still echoing in his mind. He wondered if he would ever again have the courage to leave the safety of these stone walls. He lay motionless, still listening, but all was now silent, and at last he turned fell asleep again, or wandered into some other unremembered dream. There are many ways to approach this, and the easiest is that this is merely a glimpse of what Gandalf has experienced in his dealings with Saruman. 
Frodo later recounts this dream to Gandalf upon their reuniting at the House of Alrond, and well, it seems very accurate. Frodo is not the only character who catches glimpses of different events. The brothers, Boromir and Faramir of Gondor seek out the refuge of Imladris due to a recurring dream that Faramir repeatedly has, although Boromir will later share the experience too. For a way to understand what is being seen, one can liken them to spontaneous glimpses through a permeable surface, akin to the construction of Galadriel's mirror, which itself grants prophetic visions, even if not all those visions come to pass. Things that were things that are, and some things that have not yet come to pass. The Mirror of Galadriel is a fixed portal that allows for the kind of second sight that others only experience temporarily, either in moments of extreme exhaustion, fear, or sickness in the hallucinations of a fevered mind. There is though another significant vision that Frodo experiences, this time though he is atop Amon Hen. Then at last his gaze was held. Wall upon wall, battlement upon battlement, black, immeasurably strong, mountain of iron, gate of steel, tower of adamant, he saw it. Arad Dor, fortress of Sauron, all hope left him, and suddenly he felt the eye. There was an eye in the dark tower that did not sleep, he knew that it had become aware of his gaze. A fierce eager will was there, it leapt towards him. Almost like a finger he felt it, searching for him. Very soon it would nail him down, know just exactly where he was. Amon Law it touched, it glanced upon Tol Brandir. He threw himself from the seat, crouching, covering his head with his grey hood. He heard himself crying out, never, never, or was it, verily I come, I come to you? He could not tell. Then as a flash from some other point of power there came to his mind another thought, take it off, take it off. Fall, take it off, take off the ring. This is the moment Frodo becomes aware that the Lord of the Rings himself, Sauron, has been desperately seeking him out. Always, hungrily, unceasingly, and the ring, as Gandalf tells him. The ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Think about Bilbo's moment of realisation when Gandalf tries to talk him into leaving the ring behind. Bilbo initially agrees, but inwardly hesitates. Well, no. And yes. It is at this point that he realises he had deceived Gandalf, falsely claiming to have placed the ring on the mantelpiece when he knew it was concealed in his pocket. This same lack of self-awareness is precisely what the ring instills in its bearer. In moments when Bilbo contends with the influence of the ring, Gandalf is present, albeit interacting from a distance. Just as Frodo once glimpsed Gandalf from afar atop Orthanc in his feverish dreams, this is a world where spirits communicate across distances, and characters extend their will outward in tangible ways, akin to a grasping hand. If we continue with that quote from a moment ago though, the two powers strove in him. For a moment, perfectly balanced between their piercing points, he writhed, tormented. Suddenly he was aware of himself again. Frodo, neither the voice nor the eye, free to choose, and with one remaining instant in which to do so. He took the ring off his finger. He was kneeling in clear sunlight before the high seat. A black shadow seemed to pass like an arm above him. It missed Amon Hen and groped out west and faded. Then all the sky was clean and blue and birds sang in every tree. This one is interesting because later we get Gandalf's perspective and thought on the same point, though the moments are aligned in time, if not chronologically. His thought was ever upon Frodo and Samwise, over the long leagues his mind sought them in hope and pity. Maybe Frodo felt it, not knowing it, as he had upon Amon Hen, even though he believed that Gandalf was gone, gone forever into the shadow of Moria far away. Yet Frodo is of stern stuff, marked by the heroic determination and an unwavering sense of purpose intertwined with the looming fate that burdens him. He exemplifies bravery without becoming insensitive, unyielding yet delicate. His purpose transcends the greater war that rages both externally and within himself. As the fellowship gradually breaks, Frodo reaches a pivotal decision, to undertake the arduous journey to Mordor alone. As Frodo himself says, I will do now what I must, 
Such a declaration would be unimaginable not just for a hobbit, but really for any being. Yet in the end, even Aragorn himself pays tribute to the hobbits. You bow to no one. Frodo's visions are gifted to him, but on a slightly different thought here, and maybe somewhat of a side quest if you will. Who convened the Council of Alrond? When we think about the matters discussed, their great significance and urgency, it might be assumed that envoys of each attendant might have sent word by rider to the borders of Rivendell to arrange some sort of meeting with Alrond. And also, what has this got to do with what I've discussed so far? Well, in the text, the events have come together in such a way that each people, the dwarves, they've lost contact with Balin's folk in Moria, the elves of Mirkwood, they've brought tidings that Gollum has escaped from their watch. And at the same time, two brothers and soldiers of men of Gondor have had the same dream when the word Imladris and Halfling come to mind. We all know Strider's riddle, the poem that has come to represent Tolkien's best. All that is gold does not glitter, not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither, deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken, a light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken, the crownless again shall be king. This is Strider's riddle, a text sent for Frodo and Bree so that he can confirm Strider's true identity. The letter is sent by Gandalf, who was delayed, as Frodo glimpsed in his first dream, and this poem is composed by Bilbo. There is a partner verse, however, to be found in the shared dream of Faramir and Faramir. As we said, Faramir had this dream before his brother shared the vision, yet it was Boromir who was sent, though Rivendell at the time of the council was something out of legend and no one could quite be sure that it still stood or if it had merged into the earth. The words that come to them mirror the poem in Strider's riddle, in many ways that surely must be intentional. Seek for the sword that was broken, in Emladris it dwells. There shall be counsels taken, stronger than Morgul's spells. There shall be shown a token, the doom is near at hand. For Isildur's bane shall waken, and the halfling forth shall stand. It is noteworthy that each group had come of their own accord, each was compelled by events and brought together at a simple place, at a time, for a purpose, and this culmination of all the three peoples coming together in the legendary realm of Rivendell shows that the forces of good are still active and at work, if more quietly than before, and that fate has a steady hand on Middle Earth. When Frodo first regains consciousness here and he is told the time and the place, he says to Gandalf, I saw you, cried Frodo. You were walking backwards and forwards, the moon shining your hair. Gandalf paused, astonished, and looked at him. It was only a dream, said Frodo, but it suddenly came back to me. I had quite forgotten it. It came some time ago, after I left the Shire, I think. When he makes the decision to go to Mordor at the council, Frodo was not fully comprehending the weight of his decision. Following the profound visions experienced within the Old Forest, and then at Rivendell, Frodo consciously opts to undertake this arduous path, embracing whatever perils may lie ahead. And you have someone like Gandalf letting him do so. I will help you. Man. Someone as wise as this wizard might have understood that these visions were sent to Frodo for a reason. There was a purpose, a higher purpose, behind their message. And then when Frodo makes this decision on his own, it is to do it alone as well, albeit as Master Samwise says, Of course you are! And I'm coming with you! But nonetheless, Frodo chooses to embark on his daunting task, recognising that the right course of action is not always the easiest to achieve, and the visions that have come to him, through no effort of his part, helped him come to this decision. I'm glad you're with me. So there we have it. The dreams and visions in The Lord of the Rings have a big impact on our characters, especially Frodo. It's hard to describe all of them, but they really drive the characters and mark important moments in the story. It is difficult to say what would have happened if these visions hadn't influenced the character's decision about the ring and the war. Even though Frodo is just a hobbit, and the mission's success doesn't depend solely on him, his dreams, visions, and glimpses of the future, these are what set things in motion and help the hero succeed. These visions and dreams are important parts of the story. They give us a peek into what's to come, guide the characters, and show us how much they struggle. 
They make the story more interesting and remind us that we can't always understand what lies ahead. Throughout the book, these visions do two things. They give important information and hint at what will happen later on. They also show us that the characters and the world that they live in are connected in special ways. The visions come from higher powers and show us how destinies are intertwined. In the end, the dreams and visions in The Lord of the Rings are powerful tools in the story. They make it more complex and help us understand the struggles and fates of the characters. They show us that mortal minds can only understand so much and that sometimes we need help from above. At the same time, they highlight the bravery and determination of Frodo and his friends. These visionary experiences contribute to the timeless and captivating nature of Tolkien's epic tale of Middle-earth. With that now though, it is time for my question of the day, which is, do you have a favourite quote from The Lord of the Rings? Is it maybe one of the poems, a speech, or something else entirely? What is it, and why? Let me know your thoughts and favourite quotes in the comment section down below. Thanks again to G2A for sponsoring this video today. Remember to check out our link in the description below to not miss out on this amazing offer. And now to shout out our patrons. You guys have been amazing in supporting our short film project. We have got some amazing updates coming soon. We are really making good progress and I cannot thank you all enough. We have the Divine Power tier member of Kevin, the Fire Demon tier member of Nasheeth, and the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew, and Hunter. You are all true legends of the Bro Hiram. Finally, I really appreciate your time in watching this video today. If you've enjoyed the content, please consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell icon with notifications enabled so that you will get notified when all future videos are released. Thank you once again for your support, and I look forward to seeing you next time on The Broken Sword.